I'm Alexander Lowry, and welcome to this special bonus episode of the Boardroom Bound Podcast. As I think about fun ways to share with our audience how to bring their best selves in the boardroom, I thought, let's take the show on the road. Let's go live. We went down to the recent National Association of Corporate Directors Annual Board Leader Summit, which is the largest and most important director forum in the world. It's where the greatest minds in governance convene to take on the largest issues facing today's boardrooms and collectively discover the future of exemplary board leadership. And we did a live episode of the podcast we were there. We had several hundred people sitting in the room, and we were talking with Tom Le- who is one of the leading thinkers in this space. Tom's been on a variety of boards going back 30 years. He has been a CEO in five different industries. He has worked in a range of opportunities from startups to mature companies to ones navigating survivability. He's been on in four countries on three different continents. He's been in different types of board structures from public to private to ESOPs. And he's got the public sector experience. He worked in the White House. He was the mayor of Dallas. He ran for the U.S. Senate. Tom has been there and done it. And he had so much knowledge and lessons learned to share and it was so much fun for me to share it live. So let me bring you this special episode of the show that we recorded live at the NACD Annual Board Summit. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our speakers for this session. Alexander Lowry and Tom Leppert. I'm going to let these gentlemen kind of take it away. So thank you so much, and we're thrilled to have you. Megan, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with all of you today. On a podcast recording, I usually don't get this many faces looking back at me. Occasionally, I'll have one person in the studio. Usually, it's over the phone. So this is a treat for all of us today. And as Megan said, this will be an interactive session. So Tom and I have got a lot of ground to cover, but we're going to leave time for all of you to ask questions as well. So I'll give you a prompt before we do that at the end, but we would love for you to ask all the hard and challenging questions that I don't get time to ask Tom today. So the Boardroom Bound podcast is meant for people that are either aspiring in their board career, earlier in their board career, or perhaps thinking, how do I take it to the next level and go to the portfolio? So hopefully for all of you, this will be relevant, but I know you're in different stages of that. So we'll cover all of that today. Tom's career will span that entire breadth. You will hear that. We'll be able to go deep into several subjects on it. And I'm thrilled to be able to do this today, Tom, because uh, you have a unique background in history that we're going to talk about. So first, we got 30 years of board career. So yep. things have changed over time. We'll talk about that. You've been the CEO of five different companies in five different industries. Three of those was the first day you were in the industry was the first day you were CEO. Yes. So a lot of history and learning there. You've been on, I think, four different countries, three different continents. Yep. So lots of knowledge to talk about all the boards. uh, Four different countries. So very relevant for our audience today. So let's just start and set the scene. What was it like when you got your first board role? How did that come about? Um, I had been headed up a large subsidiary of a holding company, and we spun the company off. So I became a member of the board of the new company as we went public. Okay. And for context, there's a story before you got that first board role. Um, for a lot of people in the audience, or people when I talked about how they get boards, they say, what's the story I need to have? And it almost sounds magical when the first board happens. But you had done a lot behind the scenes to make that happen. So let's short circuit it. Harvard Business School for your MBA. Yep. McKinsey after that. White House Fellow, briefly, yep. in between that. And then eventually five different CEO types stepped out of that uh, after one of the major CEO roles leading a big company to become mayor of Dallas. Yep. Then went back and became another CEO again. So we will circle all of this back, but there's a lot of story behind how that works, and we'll, we'll touch those pieces today. So you got that first board Maybe role. Maybe nightmares, too, but stories, too, yes. <laughs> okay, that's the honest stuff we'll talk about. So you've got that first board role. Today, people would say you have a portfolio of board roles. Talk us through the idea of thinking, actually, I'd like to have more than one. Maybe I make this part yeah. of my professional career. Um, I, I think it's fascinating to work with boards. So I have been involved in not only the breadth that you have mentioned, but literally from startups, to establish companies, a variety of different structures from public to private, including ESOPs, uh, involved in family businesses, et cetera. So quite a range. Today I'm working view glass, uh, probably more than a startup, but still at an embryonic stage. Austin Industries is an ESOP that's well over 100 years. And then I'm involved in a company by the name of Floor, uh, which is a 100-year-old engineering construction company that has been involved in the last several quarters of having some real challenges um, in terms of write-offs of major projects. Um, so it is a complete range of different issues and challenges. But maybe even more so, you've, you've got startups that you've talked about, you've got mature companies, but you've also had some that were struggling financially, if we put it Absolutely. kindly, right? So we can talk about that entire breadth. So at some point you decided, this would be great, uh, we would look at you now and say, career portfolio board member. 
there's a change that has to happen in someone's mind to realize they want to do that. And part of it is if you're a five-time CEO, you are used to solving problems, to making it all happen. When you move over to the board side permanently, noses in, fingers out, big difference. It, it is a very different role. And, and it was one that, to be truthful with you, there was some adjustment. As CEO, you can get involved in the issues, um, clearly spend a lot of time, and you are the one on the firing line expected to make those decisions. I believe a board member is very different than that. Uh, the analogy that I will use is you are part of a team. You want to have a strong board, but you don't want to have strong dominating board members. It needs to work as a team. So as a CEO, clearly more responsibility individually. The board, all of a sudden, you are part of a team, and that dominating role simply doesn't work anymore. Well, let's put some context around that. So you were a CEO. You had boards in multiple situations. What was that like for you managing up and reporting into a board to help give all of us some context before we talk about it from the other side? I, I think it's been an advantage for me to have been a CEO and worked with my own boards and then gone into situations where I was on the board but not involved in, in the company. Uh, I think in that sense, you've got a sense of empathy with some of the challenges that the individual CEOs have and can identify with some of the issues. Likewise, hopefully, I was able to convey some of that information, that knowledge, to the other board members who had ne necessarily had not been in those positions. And there's a big discussion today about whether we should separate the chair and the CEO roles. So my prior role at J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon, I would say the best banker of his generation, probably very well qualified to do both of those. Uh, there are some people today, I might say, perhaps we should separate them. What are your thoughts on that, having been in those seats? My, and to be frank with you, my view of that has evolved over time. Uh, there was a time at which I thought it was fine to have them being in the same individual, uh, one individual having the same roles. I've evolved now, and I think in part because board service has shifted and changed. There is so much more emphasis from a public standpoint on looking at the performance of the boards, uh, clearly from the investors, but even internally looking at employees too. There is a whole set of issues there in and of itself. And I honestly think now, having seen it both sides and trying to be as objective as possible, that there are two different positions and your governance is improved from an objective standpoint of having that, having that balance of power, so, so, so to speak. So my, my view has evolved. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't some situations where it clearly could be appropriate to have one individual. But as a general rule, I honestly believe now, and I think you're seeing it evolve over time, that you're going to end up with those two different positions. As I mentioned, I've been involved in board service in a lot of other countries too, mm -hmm. UK, Australia, et cetera. And in those, it is taken as a given that there'll be different positions. And in fact, in the UK, you have uh, chairmen that are spending a lot more of their time involved in their service to the board as chairman. So it's two distinct positions. Well, let's talk about that because you, you talked about having a strong board, and we should explain what that means because as we talked about in the general session beginning yesterday, uh, there's a fine line between, say, 30 years ago when you started in the board and the number of questions and the types of insights the board asked about versus what's expected today. What does that line mean, and maybe it's different by industries, different by companies, between stepping over too far into management's role? Well, I, I think a lot of time, and it goes both ways. Um, clearly with more focus on the board, you have had board members who have kind of taken that and run too far with it. So all of a sudden they get involved in engaging. And the, where I draw the line is, is it counsel and advice as a team vis-a-vis -vis an individual management, or an individual board member designating a particular action to be taken. When a board member is specifying an individual action to be taken and it's not part of the board, they've gone over the line. Now, to me, as I said, you want to have a strong board. But what we will always do in the boards I'm involved in is as much as possible sit down with management as a team and go through an evaluation. So I'll give you an example that literally came out of last week where there were a couple of issues that, that came out of that, that an executive session that needed to be communicated with the CEO. Um, <clears throat> most of those issues, I actually brought the CEO back in. And although I was the spokesperson, I had my other board members there and went through a list of issues and concerns and ideas, counsel, advice, et cetera. There were one or two other issues which I was more sensitive to, so I communicated to my board that I will deal with those with the CEO on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I think there's some judgment, but again, I think even in that situation where I'm one-on-one, -on -one, I need to be clear that I'm speaking for the board, 
not for myself. Again, it's a team sport. And how do you view the opportunities of different board members? So we have people in their range of experiences here, some perhaps on their first board, uh, maybe just a committee member, others who are committee chairs, some who are full board chairs, a lead independent director. How do those different roles play into what you're talking about, about being a strong team player on that strong board? Um, again, I think it's each individual bringing the different skills, background, and experience that, that they have and trying to focus on that. That's a lot of what we talk about diversity. Now, a lot of times we talk about uh, at diversity from an ethnic standpoint, we talk about from gender standpoint, uh, and I am a strong advocate of all of the above, but diversity is even more than that. Diversity is looking at experience, it's looking at areas of expertise, those sorts of things, and having that balance that goes across the, the, the board. I describe it as diversity of thought, which I think is essential, and, and you and I have talked about there's different groupings of that before. So clearly gender is something that we can all see in the photo of the board. I'm um, involved in 2020 women on board, big fan of that. Um, minority status, uh, different places in the world that you might have lived, socioeconomic status as your background. Uh, you and I are pretty tall, maybe we check those boxes on the board. So there are different ways to look and think about it. Also age is very common now and people are saying, maybe we shouldn't all be pale male and stale. Maybe we should have some younger yeah. people for our demographic. So if you are a board chair and you're pushing for this, what does that actually look and feel like? How are you involved in that movement today to change the boardroom? I think a lot of it is just looking, first of all, at the company and what the company needs. I think sometimes we jump out and we kind of put all the companies in the same bucket, so to speak, and think that there is a generic formula for boards of X women, X minority, X, Y, or X, Y. I think you really have to step back and say, what are the needs of the company? And importantly, those change over time too. Uh, it is one of the reasons that I think there actually should be term limits for, for board members. I know that's not popular with a lot of board members, but it really should be. The, the challenges of all the companies I'm involved in today, 10 years ago they were very different and required different skills, not only of the management, but of the board members. And I can almost guarantee you that 10 years from now that's gonna be the same situation, where the board members today may be terrific and making enormous contributions and providing value to the company, but in 10 years the world's gonna change and those skills, those expertise may not be appropriate and they'll be replaced by new skills and expertise that that company needs to have to be successful in the future. I remember landing my first major board role and I walked into the first meeting and there was one woman, uh, everyone was white, and I was the only one south of 50 and I was much less than 50. And I remember sitting to myself in the first board meeting having a conversation thinking, how are we gonna innovate? Now it's possible, but if, if people are all from a similar background and experience, they were all from the same part of the world thinking, this is actually gonna be hard. Uh, this was in the UK and I'll, I'll teach you one of my favorite British words today. So I, I talk about I'm bilingual, I lived there seven years, I speak British and American. And there's a term in the British called naughty. And when you are new in a role, think about your first day in a job, you get to ask the naughty question. Basically, uh, two months after, people would say that's a stupid question, but in the beginning, you can ask a naughty question. Why do we do it like that? Have we ever thought about doing it this way? And there's that wonderful opportunity in the beginning for people to sit back and go, that's interesting. How have you approached that on your boards when you're a new board member? Well, I think there's a great advantage being a new board member. As we were talking about, when you think about grouping, I'll give you the example. You could have a third ethnic minority, a third women, and a third other. And if they had all had a background where they went to a boarding school and then on to Harvard, I would argue that you don't have very much diversity, even though you would have seen that in terms of the pictures of the people, but you don't have that diversity. As to being, in, and, and I think I've had an advantage in my life, I was raised by a single mom. Um, she didn't have an education, so the only thing she could do that was white collar was be a secretary, and she did that for 40 years. I had a chance to see what discrimination was like because in a lot of cases, she knew much more, it was a small mortgage company, she knew much more about secondary markets, et cetera, than any of the men that were involved in the business, but because she was a woman and didn't have an education, she never had that opportunity. That not only affected her, it affected me, and I would argue it affected the company. You didn't simply bring the best skills and expertise to, to, to bear. And I've had a chance uh, to be involved in a lot of community type of things, even before I was involved in, in, in the public sector. And I saw the value of that. The reality of it is the people in this room, this is not a picture of what the world looks like and it's not a picture of your customers. Unless you have people that engage in the community and understand what the real world looks like, you're gonna make mistakes. I think a lot of managements go far off 
for the rail simply because they talk to themselves. They're kind of, and again, it could be the diversity that we think of, but once you get on the 52nd floor and that's all that you're focusing in on, you don't have an appreciation of what the real world looks like in the United States, much less the rest of the, of the world. Uh, being a new time uh, or a new board member, I think is the best situation you can have simply because you can ask any question that you want. Uh, and I really think it's important, a lot of boards don't do it, and individual board members sh should, of going out of their way to really set up a list of things that you want to go through. You know, I want to see all the financial statements. I want to see not the financial statements, but I want to see the CEO's reports that go to him or her. I want to see any dashboards that you have. I want to be able to talk, my rule, is in a large company, at least all, everybody at the level reporting to the CEO, in a medium-sized company, I go two levels down. So it's kind of what the end, end two from that standpoint. I want to be able to talk to all those people. I will spend a lot of time with the general counsel. I'll spend a lot of time with the fin financial people. But you've got a chance to be able to do that. And a lot of boards, again, become insular. They, the, the good boards are proactive and they're external focused. Too many boards are internal focused and they become very reactive to situations. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that can be done on that. If you're a new board member, it's a great time to be able to throw those out. Why aren't we having board meetings, not in a headquarters board room, but why aren't we having it at a facility? Why aren't we having it at one of our stores, et cetera, things like that in very diff different settings? Um, I'm a big one that, uh, and again, this will be kind of controversial, too many boards rely on the CEO. Again, I was a CEO, but too many boards rely on the CEO. That's their source of information. If that's your source of information, I can guarantee you, you're gonna be in trouble at some point. You have to be able to have access to all the executives. You've gotta be willing as a board member to go out and look at facilities, look at the operations, those sorts of things. Home Depot has a great little game they play. It's not a game, but they require from their board members that three times a year, a board member has to go to a Home Depot store and write a report on it. That should be done more often because again, when you start seeing and become insular of looking at the financials come in, when all of a sudden you rely on management to tell you what customers are thinking, et cetera, that's just a recipe for failure. You should be asking for external reviews. You should be trying to get customer reviews all of those sorts of things become valuable and you should never see anything coming from complete lines, 800 lines, et cetera, that are filtered. You always want to see the raw data because that's the only way you can look at trends. And you were saying that even the best companies, the honest companies, you're not going to get everything you need from that. And you know, a couple of stories back in my own day when I was a strategy consultant, I remember one company, I will not name, they always had the annual fire drill day during a board off, off site because the board never needed to be there if there was a fire in the building, right? They didn't want to be in convenience coming down the 50 floors. Boards and management teams can tend to be on their own and feel like they should be separated. You're saying they should do different things. Uh, Cheryl Batchelder, who's a friend of mine, she's on the Chick-fil-A board, Pier 1, a couple other boards. She was talking about how Chick-fil-A, every time they have a board meeting, they have to go visit stores. And they're interacting with customers, interacting with employees to get that feedback. Home Depot, it sounds like another great example. Why aren't more boards doing stuff like this? And getting and out part of the is harder work. It takes more time. And, you know, a lot of times that's not what boards do. And, and again, to be frank with you, in a lot of cases, boards don't need to do that. The company's doing well. You've got management in place. You might be in an industry. There's not many of them where there's not a lot of change, et cetera. And a very laissez-faire approach can play out. The problem is you're rolling the dice. Um, if you were at CBS, you thought things were in great shape. You all of a sudden, and as I say this, any management or any board member is one story on the front page away from it being a public official. They are all public officials now. And they relied on management as their only source of information. And they basically stepped back and really delegated all responsibility to, to management and their board responsibilities. Um, I'm sure they wish that wasn't the case today, but it's a very hard lesson that they've learned. So I think that was the tweet for the day, by the way. And I would love for your perspective on, you said you need different information sources. You need to gather different metrics, different data, getting it from different places. You also said, if you're a new board member, you want to meet with that wide range of people. I can certainly understand that. 
What happens if there are 12 board members and they all want all of that senior person time? Does a company react well to that? Do they feel like their toes are being stepped on? Again, it's got to be managed in the right way. Okay. I mean, if everybody wants to do it, you can do it in groups of three. You can have that individual come in and do presentations, so it can be a 12-on-one. There's a lot of different ways that you can get it, and even in a board room, with a couple of very probing questions, you can start seeing if, if there's issues that are involved and, and there, there, there's concerns. A, a lot of it, too, is looking not at where you are today, but where you need to be. I think too many, especially in the financial side, we rely on accounting metrics and not forward-looking metrics not share of market, not looking at trends, not looking at financial drivers that determine what the financial statements will look like in a year. Instead, we look at the financial statements. And in some cases, um, I'm not sure the board really defines what their role is. Uh, a lot of boards are compliance oriented. We will go through and we will do everything. We'll review the financial statements, we'll make sure the attorneys sign off on that and that sort of thing. Um, I had an occasion to, uh, I do some lecturing at a, at a university near me, and um, I came in and did a guest lecture, and two weeks later, uh, a gentleman by the name of Fastow was also going to come in. And I thought that'd be interesting to come, come listen to. Um, Fastow, if you've forgotten, was the chief financial officer of a small little operation by the name of Enron. And it was interesting because as he went through it, he said that, look, every single thing I did, Every single thing I did met gap requirements. It was reviewed by internal counsel. It was reviewed by external counsel. It was signed off by external accounting. And everyone was approved by the board. In fact, he said, one day I even showed him my spreadsheet that showed all the different deals and the impact. The title of the spreadsheet was Truth. Now, here's my point on that was his job and the board's to make sure that every single transaction narrowly met gap, et cetera, or was it to prevent financial statements that fairly showed the overall health of the company? That's a lot of the difference, is the objective to ensure the strength of the company and the sustainability into the future, or is it simply to make sure that we deal with all the compliance issues that you would see in Delaware state law? Well, I think that's one of your charges that you would give to everybody today as they go back to the boardrooms they're working on is there is a bare minimum that you need to. And of course, you have to be over that hurdle. Legally. You are, you're responsible with that. Uh, but you see there's a hierarchy that you can move up towards. And, and let's talk about that. So clearly, strategy is up there, what that looks and feels like. You were talking about getting data sources from different places, making sure you are aware. And you know, frankly, board members don't get credit for keeping themselves off of the front page of the newspaper. But they certainly get beat up yeah. when they're on there. How should someone think about moving up that hierarchy? I, I do think it's a pyramid. I think at the, at the bottom is that, what I'll call compliance, it's the minimal standards. Kind of next level up is we're thinking about succession and doing succession planning. Next level up, we're engaged in the culture of the organization, and we're trying to mold the culture. And then the top piece is the strategy piece. Where is this company going to go in the future? Uh, a, a great question for that is how are you going to make money in five years? Most managements are going to turn around and basically give you an answer that says, we're just going to do what we're doing, but we're going to do it better. That may be, in today's world, the case with one in five companies, one in four. But most companies, not that the case. You need, as board members, to ask management, why are you different than all the other companies out there? That becomes a much more difficult question. Um, you see the companies that move up there, Clearly, they become much more proactive in the way that they're thinking as opposed to reactive. They're trying to drive value as opposed to go through the basic elements of being a board member. I really think that's what d distinguishes it. And as I said, you can see it in the metrics people use. In the good companies, they're looking at metrics that are those drivers for future performance, not reviewing past performance. It's those elements that I think become important. And I imagine that's the exciting and hopefully not daunting part of being a board member as well. That is our opportunity to be learning about different industries, different sectors, different ideas, looking ahead, uh, bringing ideas perhaps to the board, connecting after different events like this where you probably have talked to someone and heard about what they're doing in an entirely different industry. How are you staying on top of all the stuff that's going on in the world and bringing those thoughts back to your various boards? Yeah, and I, I think a lot of it is the things that we all do. Um, it's reading, it's talking to people, it's doing things like this, of being willing to invest in getting together with other people and talk about the issues and those sorts of things. A lot of it's too attitudinal. 
you know, again, as an individual, am I willing to put the time in not to go through statements, but I'm really putting the time in to try to add value to the company and be a good counselor to management. Um, I think a lot of it is wrapped up in, in, in that. It really becomes an attitude of, am I there to sit down and go through a quarterly or an every other month meeting? Or am I really putting in the time to understand the company, go to the stores, go to the facilities, et cetera, do those sorts of things, pick up the phone and call. I mean, I, I spend a bunch of time just getting on the phone with people in between meetings, either as the chair talking to my board members um, or as a board member talking to various members. I and mean, I, I will make sure that I try to get together in between each board meeting. And again, I think it's the chair's responsibility, not necessarily just for every board member, but to sit down with all the senior managers, to at least sit down and visit with them and just get some sense. It starts with open questions. How are things going? What do you see? What's different than we visited last? And out of that comes a different set of conversations. Um, in, I think we also need to understand that as board members, we're at an enormous disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis management. It, it is an enormous. We come in every other month, every quarter, what, whatever it has been. Keep in mind management, and again, I was there, lives with the issues 24-7. And so boards really have to work hard. If you're sitting there looking at PowerPoint presentations and that's all you're doing, that's a pretty difficult ex exercise. I mean, if all you're seeing is a PowerPoint presentations, financials are not very well shown in PowerPoint presentations. There's a great value in simply seeing statements and being able to go through those, those statements. Um, other things that I think become important from a communication standpoint, um, I do it where I'm chair um, I get, I'll get all the information that's going to the board in advance, and then I will go through it with the CEO, and then I will write my own memo up to the board. It usually turns out to be about five or six pages, um, and, and I try to do a couple of different things with it. One is I'll go through and identify what I see are the issues, where the, the sensitivities are, if I know of something that we ought to spend extra time on, if there's particular areas that may be sensitive to particular members of management, et cetera, but try to develop an agenda and kind of give an overview. The first thing I'll do is I'll send that to the CEO and I'll say, okay, does this make sense? Am I missing something, et cetera? So I always give the CEO the first shot at saying, eh, not sure you got that right. I'd rather not deal with that, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'll send it out to the board. So the board's then got um, an advantage of seeing at least some type of a more detailed agenda of what the issues and what areas that we may discuss. That clearly doesn't limit the freedom of any board member to raise their hand and bring an issue uh, up, up to do it. But it does define and hopefully focus the board meeting so it can be a little bit more valuable. Uh, as I indicated a moment ago, I am, uh, uh, PowerPoints, I think you've just gotten so misused and are so useless in mo most cases. Um, and you need to have discussions. I'll give you another example. So we had a uh, strategy, my view, should be dealt with at every meeting. But I do think there's an opportunity that a board should take one day, so your issues and that sort of thing, and just do a deep dive on the strategy of, of the company. So this company prepared an awful lot of materials, and my view is the board member's responsibility to do it. So instead of having them go through it, I basically went to each board member and each member of management and said, you can put two issues on the board. We put two issues and then we started focusing conversations on particular issues as opposed to walking through 200 pages of slides, which I probably wouldn't have been around for the end of it anyway. Uh, but nevertheless, it forced the, both management and the board members to focus on what was most of concern to them. And it could be an issue, it could be a question, it could be something they just thought was wrong, but that they got two. If somebody put up three, that was fine, but, but two of them. And then we went and focused conversation over the next four hours on particular issues. Uh, I think people felt it was much more valuable. Well, let's think about ideas that people might take away from the conference and go back to their boards, whether they're chair or member, whatever it might be. What are your thoughts on whether you should have executive sessions, perhaps, I've heard some people say twice, at the beginning and the end, sometimes with the CEO, sometimes without, to make sure all the dialogue is happening, to make sure all the board members are engaged. What are your thoughts on that? I, I think you have to have executive sessions at the end. If you don't, 
then you are leaving so much valuable information on the table. Um, the way I usually do it is to have an executive session, first of all, with management, with the CEO. And the CEO at that point can kind of express any concerns that they have, anything that's come up that they might have a different spin on, et cetera. Um, then we'll ask he or she to leave, and then we'll have a conversation just with board members. And I will literally go around to every single board member, issues, concerns, what was important, what didn't seem right, is there anything out there that just didn't smell right, et cetera, those sorts of things, and we'll go around. As I indicated, in some cases it'll be, here's an issue that we need to spend more time with the CEO on. I will then bring the CEO, he or she, back into the room, and then we'll go back through it again. As I said, I will do a little bit of assessment of what issues are best, and sometimes there's an issue that is better to deal with on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I'll always go through that. Um, there have been times when I've used executive sessions at the front. That is usually limited from my perspective on when the CEO says, um, I want to say something up front. We'll be dealing with it when all of management's there, but I want to be able to give you a perspective on that before we get into it. So I'll give you an example. A division wasn't going very badly, and it was, was, was going badly, and the CEO had a personnel action that he, he was going to take in that case. He communicated that, so during the conversation with those people in the room, we didn't spend a whole lot of time going off on that tangent. Um, I am usually hesitant to do that, though, and the reason that I'm hesitant to do it is in most board situations, you've got a number of different people that are waiting outside and that. So if all of a sudden the CEO goes in and spending 45 minutes with the board, the rest of the people are going, what in the world's going on? It just builds anxiety. And again, I'm sensitive of having been on the other side of the table that you don't really want to do that. So while I will use it on an exception basis, for the most part, I don't think it makes sense. And if there's a lot of those sorts of things that, I'll, as I said, I'll deal with it in my memo that'll go in advance that basically says, this is an issue, don't worry about it, we'll deal with it in an executive session. I'd say it a little bit better than that, but that's the gist. Now, we've made an assumption in this conversation that you have a strong board, you have an effective board. And I'm sure there's some people in the room thinking, I've got all sorts of ideas I want to take back to the boardroom about how we can be even better and raise our game. Maybe we should talk about that, and this can happen from a couple different perspectives, and I'd love your thought on it. I'm sure some of you have the experience where maybe the CEO drives the board. Maybe he's helping picking the members. There might be on the other side where people who are on the board, perhaps they've been there too long, they got in for the wrong reasons, the wrong method. What are your thoughts on how you make sure you've got the right board and the right responsibilities? I've got lots of scars on my back from this one. Um, T-shirt too? I, um, I, I think there's, and I've been involved, to be frank with you, in a number of dysfunctional boards. Um, in some cases, it's an alignment question. Uh, I was involved with a uh, relatively young company, and it had a group on the board that were venture capitalists that had done some of the initial funding of the company. The evolution of the company had taken much longer than was expected by those venture capitalists, and to be truthful with you, went beyond their, their funds. The capital requirements of the company got large, and although they put significant money on the front end, those venture capitalists, you know, 20 million-ish or something, then the funding got up to be in nine digits, and clearly you had a different set of investors that came in at that point. And those investors had a very different view, is I'm putting in nine digits, I'm in this thing forever. I mean, I'm, I'm in it because this is a great opportunity, and I don't want to shortchange everything else. Well, the venture capitalists, their funds were kind of saying, hey, hold it, you said this thing was going to be over in five years and this is still going. And we ended up with enormous misalignment that created dysfunction within the boardroom because you had a group that was trying to do everything they could to, in effect, wind the company down. You had a group of people that were saying, I see great opportunity, I'm going to go forward. There were two independent directors, myself and another one, and then you basically had a group that was split about evenly. It was a very difficult situation. I think in a lot of boards, you have to ask that question, what is the alignment? What's the true interest? Why is somebody there? A lot of times, it's not out of benevolence. Um, it is they have a different agenda. Or somebody brought them there, getting to your second point. A lot of times, you see boards where the CEO kind of basically brings it in. And I've been in those situations, and it can, it can be disastrous. I, I've, I've been in board meetings where, um, the CEO kind of 
felt it was their company and only their company, even though it was public, and made comments like, okay, CFO, you've got five minutes to give the financial report. I gotta go catch an airplane. Those are not productive. The misalignment, I think you can work with over time. To be frank with you on some of these other things, I think it's very difficult. You need to assess if you can generate value and provide value or not. Now in a few minutes, I'm gonna invite all of you to ask some of your hard questions to Tom. But before we do that, I would love to tee up some of the stuff that we're seeing changing in the world and clearly will continue to change, I believe. So you have served in many different places in government. We are seeing perhaps a blurring of the lines, that bifurcation between the public and private sector is shifting. Clearly Sarbanes-Oxley began to push the bar in a different direction when that came about. Uh, activists are changing the way the board is working as well today. How are you seeing that today versus when you started 30 years ago and what do you project forward as well? I think the bifurcation is gone. I think the public policy, the public-private bifurcation is, is absolutely gone. As I said, you are one news story away from being a public official, uh, if you like it or not. Uh, and I think that continues. I think not only do you have kind of the issues you talked about, but you have increase, increasing regulation. Uh, you have regulation, which you're seeing in California and other places, that are mandating what the membership uh, board should be. Uh, personally, I don't. I like the direction, I just don't like government having to dictate it. Now again, we've been in this situation historically as a country before, and it has mandated governmental regulation. I would hope that as an industry, as a private sector, we're smart enough to be able to deal with these issues before the government needs to, 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 to come into them. Uh, you clearly got those. The element of disruption uh, is something that is real. Uh, if you look, uh, just in the last decade, don't go back 50 years, but in the last 10 years, and look at the 10 most valuable companies. 10 years ago versus today, there's only one that's still on that list. One out of 10. That shows you the change that's taking place. So you have the regulatory element, then you all of a sudden have what I'll call external factors, but still within the private sector side of it. Uh, activist investors, um, institutions, all those sorts of things putting enormous pressures on boards and on, on companies. Uh, as I said, I think it's much more difficult to be a board member today than it was 10 or 20 years ago or clearly when I got, got involved in it. Um, it takes more time, uh, much more diligence. Um, you know, that situation I related, there were lawsuits and, lit and litigation that was involved in trying to deal with the misalignment of the board. So little issues on a board Problems don't go away, they usually get bigger, and it makes it much more difficult. And that's tough enough in the boardroom. What you've got to keep in mind is what it does to the company and to the people that are involved in the company. And if you are in those situations, you need to do everything you can to isolate those issues within the boardroom so they don't spread into the people in the company. When that happens, then all of a sudden you've got a completely different set of concerns. And I think that's a great point to segue over. I'm sure many of you have hard questions you would like to ask Tom. We've got a couple of people in the room like passing out microphones. If none of you have questions, I've got lots more I'd be happy to put to Tom, but I'd love to give you some time as well. One down the front. Uh, Philip Amoa, I'm on the board of a benefits company and a pension fund. With respect to the executive session, would you recommend that as a stand-in item at the committee level? Yes. We, we do have it at the full board level, but yeah, we, we do it with all the committees. Uh, clearly, I can't imagine how you'd operate an audit committee without doing it. If, if you're not doing executive sessions in an audit committee, I think that that's derelict. Um, and those, uh, on those, there's a series of those. We will do it with just the internal auditors. We'll do it with just the uh, outside, uh, outside council. We'll do it with just the inside council. We'll do it with outside auditors. Then we'll do it with management, et cetera. So there's a whole series of those. On the other committees, I think it's on an as-needed basis. Um, a lot of times your governance and nominating becomes an executive committee in and of itself. Um, clearly, if you've got some type of risk management, then I think that has to have some type of executive session uh, where you're going in, into issues and really give board members just a chance to, to share. As I said, one of the values of being on a board should be the concept of being a team and getting the benefit of Alex's thought, getting the, the, the benefit of Madeline's thought, et cetera, and pulling those together so it's not just one individual having to think through the issues and the challenges, but instead it's a, it's a group thing. And on those, those I think 
it's much better to bring the board and give a board a chance to uh, have that open discussion uh, among just board members. I think there's another question down in front. Can you uh, dis talk a little bit about the lead director role in two different situations? One when the chairman is the CEO and one when the chairman is not. Um, when the chairman's not, I really think that then the chairman does become the lead director. So that becomes one, one, and, one and the other. Um, the lead director role, I, again, is one of the reasons that I've kind of gone to the evolution that it's, it's kind of a division of two different responsibilities. Um, the, the lead director, I think, becomes a difficult position in the sense because you're really an intermediary. Um, you don't particularly have a role. You just kind of, at least the lead directors I've seen, kind of bounce back and forth. And in a lot of cases, kind of become a junior chairman. Um, I think it's important because, again, that's the person that kind of tries to ask when you get an executive session and go around the table and ensure that there's been um, good participation and, and input. A lot of times the lead director, even in board meetings, should be the one um, that's going around asking the independent board members their views and opinions to make sure that, 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 that they're engaged. Uh, but I, I think the lead director can be a difficult p position only because in a lot of cases it becomes the, the, the junior chairman. I think that your effort in getting your role as chair before the board meeting to define and put together your six-page report obviates the need for that in a lot of cases. Yeah, and, and it's always helped. It, 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 doing that is also helpful to me, too. And th there's a selfish side of it, too. Um, I just think in today's world we get lost on PowerPoint slides, and the value of having a pretty coherent, cogent, look at what'll be anywhere from a five to a 10 hour meeting and try to isolate that and identify the issues. That's a useful exercise for me if I'm gonna chair that session and, and it seems like it's useful for the other board members too. Hi, great uh, questions. Thank you uh, so far. I have a question around how uh, somebody who is on um, association non-for-profit boards at the present time is prepping themselves for a public company board, some sort of guidance as to the roadmap, you know, and how you do yeah. that? Uh, I've had, the, as you can imagine, from my community side and the public side, I've had a chance to, to serve on a lot of nonprofit boards. And some of those are much, much better than corporate boards that, that, that I've been on. One of the challenges is simply a numbers one. Um, the nonprofit boards tend to be very large relative to a corporate board. And that's a big difference. So if you're on a nonprofit board trying to move to corporate, I would really urge you to get involved and kind of put yourself forward to be on the executive committee or something like that that is the smaller group. That, I think, is a much better analogy and kind of parallel to being on a corporate board than just being on a nonprofit. And in a lot of cases, those executive committees are very critical. I mean, you're looking at budgets that are as large as a lot of companies, et, et cetera. But that would be the one piece of advice is, I'm not sure there's a great value in simply moving from a nonprofit to a profit because again, the size of it and the issues. And most of the nonprofits, when you go into a board meeting of 40 people, you're not having open discussion. It really does become more rote. But if you can maneuver yourself to get on the executive committee, then I think there's really good parallels. And I think that will help sell yourself, quote unquote, to go on to board meetings if you can say, by the way, I was on the executive committee, we dealt with these audit issues, we dealt with a lot of the, you know, the management issues, succession issues, which are usually done within an executive committee. Then I think you've got some very good parallels. As I said, you know, a lot of times you've got great people uh, that are involved in those. So the other value in being on those is a lot of times you'll have you know, community leaders that are involved in a lot of different boards. They may lead large organizations, either profit or nonprofit, uh, within your community. So that networking opportunity is phenomenal, as well as a chance to just sit and visit with people and get better perspectives. I mean, a lot of those folks are, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty impressive boards, to be truthful with you. What are your thoughts about the role of a director in dealing with the whole subject of ESG? Um, I think the first thing you have to do is look at it from an external standpoint. Like anything else, where the world is going and 
what my employees, what my clients, what my suppliers are asking for. It seems very clear, and if you sat in on 10 minutes of even the previous session, you understand that that's where the world's gonna go. Uh, I am a great believer that the first role of leadership is defining reality. In too many cases, what leaders do is they define reality either as they want it to be or they think it should be. The reality of it is, is where we live, those issues are becoming much more important and they are influencing decisions that are made by employees, they are making decisions by our clients, by our suppliers, and that in and of itself becomes an enormous responsibility, I think, on boards and on companies to respond to those markets. Now, I would also make an argument and try to at least convince you that the more important part of that is, what is the right thing to be doing in, 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 in today's world? And from my standpoint, it is engaging in the community. Uh, that's one of the things why I say, boards, when they become insular, that's usually where I would love to go short on their companies. It's easy to figure out when to go short on a company. Is the board insular? Are they building a big new headquarters? Did they just add a lot of people to the corporate staff, et cetera? Those are all indications to me that go short on, on, on the stock. It's doing the right thing. So I think you've got to become much more conscious of those. But again, the reason to do it isn't just because it's the nice thing to do. Hopefully we've all got that obligation. It is to ensure the long-term success of, of the company. As you heard, um, trying to bring in the best people, and you know, we see an unemployment rate of 3.8%, which is not the right rate. Don't kid yourself, that isn't even close to the right rate. But it's probably a good representation of the tightness of the labor market for highly educated, highly valuable people. Well, you're competing with them. And if you're not gonna respond and be conscious of what their needs are, especially in today's world, then you're going to have a deficiency on the talent within your company. Um, if you're not responding, you're gonna leave a lot of marketing opportunities and new business opportunities uh, behind. So again, I make the argument that it's the right thing to do, but I'll also tell you it's the right thing for the business. Um, when I was CEO, I always pushed my people, and you kind of got a sense of this earlier, that they had to get involved in the community. And again, I will tell you, I got involved in a lot of different things. In every situation I was involved in, and I spent lots of times in leadership roles in nonprofits and community organizations, in every situation, I got more out of it than I put into it. We have time for one more question. Hello, Antoine Owens. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking to us today. My question is around when you do um, initially go on a board, and sometimes you can't find out as part of the evaluation process, and there's either a lack of engagement from other board members and they're not looking at the right things, or there's misalignment of their focus or interest. Um, as a new board member, how do you think about either kind of calling out that observation and helping to move the board in the right direction, and how early do you do that? And then ultimately, if, if you can't move kind of the ship, do you decide to continue to stay on the board or do you decide to move on? Yeah, l let, me, let me deal with that, but I think there's a piece in front of that and that's the due diligence of going on a board. Again, I've gotten some right and I've gotten some wrong. Um, I'm not sure that we spend enough time on the due diligence. I think sometimes people are asked to be on boards and their initial reaction is, yes, I'm gonna go on it and that sort of thing. That's not the way you ought to go about it you really ought to spend the due diligence to understand the company. That would mean sitting down with the CEO and potentially other members of management and trying to understand what are their values. Ask them where they've come from. You know, what, what is your background? If you're leading this company, tell me what you did before. Looking at how those companies done and how they reacted can be very helpful on, on that. Um, talking to other board members. Um, not just from an interview standpoint, because a lot of times we'll take it as an interview, but instead interview them. How does the board work? Do people participate? Um, there's nothing worse than being on a board that's not congenial. I mean, I'm, I'm old enough with enough white hair that the only things I do today are with people that I like to be around. You know, life is too short. Make sure that you can just sit down and you enjoy being around those people. You're gonna be around them a long period of time and. You know, if you're gonna be on a board for 10 years, I can guarantee you, you're gonna have, and I've been involved, fortunately, with an awful lot of good companies, and we've dealt with problems you have to deal with. That's part of the game. 
How is it going to be working with those people in that, in, 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 in that environment? So I think there's a lot of pieces on due diligence that ought to be done too. Again, understand the culture of the organization. Not just what they're trying to do, but what is valued? What, what are, you know, if you, if you go into the offices, what do they talk about? You know, do, do you have some alignment so that all of a sudden, if I go into Alex's office, he's talking of roughly the same thing that Madeline's talking about. Do some of that up front. Now, to your question then. Um, if you're a new board member, um, I think there's some things you can do, although to be frank and pragmatic with you, um, you may not be able to turn around a real bad situation, but there's some things that you can do. Um, one is you can influence agenda. So you can be on the front end, again, being a little bit dumb on the front end, of saying, boy, I think we ought to di discuss this and put these things on the agenda, et cetera. So you can influence the agenda. That can be very helpful of getting people into it. Um, two, you can influence the material that comes to you. I would like to see X, Y, Z. Now, if you're on a group of 10 people that don't want to do anything, then it's going to be a bigger challenge. But usually you've got people that, if you've made good, uh, coherent arguments, are going to see the value of that and they'll rally around it. Or they may just say, gosh, it's easier to say yes to them and maybe they'll go away. So you'll get your way either way. Um, but, but doing that in terms of material. Um, having ongoing conversations with the chairman of what's going on, why are we doing it, that sort of thing. That is very valuable. Now, again, it doesn't ensure success, but putting that time up front end to kind of express issues, those sorts of things. Um, one of the things that I've, I've seen done very well with, with chairman, which, which at least will, will get the things going, is um, the best chairman to me, even basic issues, um, and I've learned this. I didn't do it all. And when I had a chairman that first started doing it on a board, I thought, gosh, that's a dumb idea. Why are we spending time on it? But what he would do, regardless of what the issue was, he would go to each board member. Okay, Do you have a thought on this? Are you OK? Issue. I thought, gosh, that's what he said. It was a great example, because nobody could fall asleep. And you had to think, then, do I have an issue coming back? Those sorts of things start pulling out, out of people. Um, when I was a CEO, I if we had an issue and all of my management team, and it was a big issue, not small ones, but a big issue, and all the management team was aligned on one side, I would always appoint one person that had to come back the next day and defend the contra. Just to be able to get some disagreement. So look at the issue from a different angle. Um, I'm not sure we ever changed the decision, but we sure changed the way we implemented kind of the issues, those sorts of things that, 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 that those things got, got involved in. So I think what you've got to do is be a little bit um, entrepreneurial in sense of looking at kind of all the levers that you can get. You do have some levers in terms of conversations with the chairman, uh, agenda items, um, materials that you ask for, those sorts of things. Those are the places that I at least start. So Tom, I think that was a great summary of the conversation today. Great ideas that all of us can take back to what we're going to be doing when we go back home. And thank you for helping make all of us more boardroom bound. Hopefully it was helpful. Thank you. This bonus episode of the podcast was so much fun, and it would not have happened without NACD, so special thank you to them for hosting it and for allowing us to be part of their annual Board Leader Summit. And I cannot recommend this more highly. You had basically 2,000 corporate executives and board members bringing together the best and the brightest cutting-edge thought leaders and industry experts, and we had four days of dialogue, interactive workshops, and unprecedented networking opportunities. If you're trying to figure out how to bring your best self into the boardroom, you've got to go to next year's conference. It's already on my calendar in September, right outside of Washington, D.C. I could not recommend it more highly. And of course, a special thank you to Tom Leppert for the lifelong lessons of bringing your best self to the boardroom and all of the knowledge that he shared with our listeners today. And you're talking about not only someone who is great at what he does in the boardroom, but a wonderful human being and enjoyed all the time to get to know him during the conference. And of course, a special thank you for you, the listeners. And if you liked what you heard, I'd ask you to rate and review the show because it helps people find us. Until then, we'll see you in the next normal episode of the podcast.